Hello, how you doing? I'm Craig Parkinson. You are listening to the Two Shot Podcast. Sit yourself down, pop the kettle on. We're going to have a nice old chat. Who's it with this week? I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> the devil are you you good you had a good week fantastic i'm pleased what you haven't had a good week okay well look sit down grab a brew because this is episode 17 and trust me it's a big one now when i say big one it's not because oh look he's got somebody dead famous on it's not that this is a guy you probably i haven't even heard of it's big in the sense that this is a big story and oh my God, does he go into it with a fine tooth comb? Um, strap in, sit down, and grab a brew or something stronger. You're going to need it. This is Michael Balligan, and it's episode 17 of the Two Shot Podcast. I'll see you in a bit. Enjoy. Michael, how are you doing? You all right? Yeah, I'm not too bad. No, because <laughs> usually we don't talk about jobs on the podcast, but I think I've got a we have to start out by talking about this because here we are in home in Manchester, which is a an amazing space for all yeah. sorts of reasons. But you're here on your first job. I'm yeah, first here. first professional job, man. It's, How's it it's all amazing. Going? Yeah, it's going really well. It's like it's a dream come true. I mean, when you're leaving drama school, you wanna. That's one of the things you're kind of anxious about. Whether you're gonna get work, you don't even know if you're ever gonna work. Yeah. So to get that before I left was like a. Oh, did this happen before you graduated? Yeah, yeah, before I graduated, yeah. Oh, congratulations, man. Yeah, That's brilliant. Yeah, So it's a dream come true, man. Yeah. And you find, have, you, have you worked in Manchester? I mean, no, you obviously haven't yeah. worked in Manchester before. Uh, actually, you, do you know what? Funny enough, before I, got, before I started drama school, we'll get into it, but I was doing this, yeah. thing, on, I was doing this thing with the radio and I came down to Media City. Yeah. And, we, and I did this interview about radios in prisons. Right. Because I was a presenter when I was in a nick yeah. presenting on this pr- na- national prison radio thing. And um, yeah, when I got released, they wanted people that were on it to come down and like do this conference thing, which is great. Yeah, it's yeah, a great yeah. setting, isn't it? Yeah, I yeah, it's nice. I do like it. I do Fantastic like it around here. place, yeah. lovely people. Yeah. Um, well, good luck, man. I hope the tour goes really well. Oh, thanks a lot, but, man. Uh, as we're at the beginning of your career, let's go back to the yeah. beginning of, of growing up. At, what was home life like? Where was home life for you? So I grew up in South London, so I grew up in a place called Kennington, which is basically right next to Brixton. Right. So I lived with my mum and my two sisters. And yeah, like everything seemed pretty normal to me. How old were your sisters? My older sister was... So my older sister didn't live with us initially, but she was in Nigeria. So when I was about four, and my little sister was two, my mum sent for her to come back to England. Right. And then she was looking after us. And my mum used to go away a lot. Because my mum was into dodgy de- dealings, to put it as nice as possible. Right, okay. So she was going away abroad, coming back to England. She was coming in and out of the country constantly. And she was leaving us alone a lot. And my older sister must have been about... She, no, tell her lie. My older sister was six years older than me, so she would have been 10. So when she got a bit older, when she was like 14, 15, and I was older, my mum started going away a lot. And, um, Did you know what was going on at this I, time? I didn't know what was going on, but I knew she was doing, I knew she was doing something a bit, I knew something wasn't right. Yeah. Because I'd come in the room and she'd be counting up loads of money or there'd be like pe- a lot of people in the house and they'd be having meetings in the living room and we'd have to go to our rooms. Right, okay. That kind of thing. So I knew something was dodgy, but I just didn't really, it didn't really phase me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I was too young to really understand what yeah, it was. Yeah, of course. Do you know what I mean? And um, who was looking after you and your sisters while your mum was? Sometimes an uncle or aunt would stay with us, but most of the time it was just us. Right. Yeah, yeah. My because my older sister was very advanced for her age because she grew up in Nigeria. Which, I mean, the lifestyle over there is completely different. I mean, kids are by themselves a lot. Yeah, of course. In Nigeria, that culture is completely different. So she came over here. She knew how to cook. She knew how to look after us. She knew what she was doing. Who was looking after your sister when she was living? In she Nigeria? was living with one of. She was living with my mum's sister. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 And then my mum came over here and then, yeah, sent her to come over. And um, where was your dad around? My dad, he was kind of, he just used to show up every now and again. I didn't really have a proper relationship with him. So he'd show up every now and again. And when I was really young, I used to think to myself, like, I used to, it was kind of got me down a bit. 
I used to be like, right, where's my dad? I used to take out my mum a bit. But yeah. My mum was like, you know, if he wanted to be around, he would. And he turned up. So eventually, as time progressed, I just looked at him as a sort. Whenever he turned up, I'd be like, right, this is an opportunity to get some money out of him. Right, so I'd of always course. be like, I need a hundred pounds or something. And he'd just give it to me. So that's whenever he turned up, I just thought, yeah, I could get some money. Yeah. Do you know I mean? And what was school life like? Yeah, you? I was, so yeah, in primary school, I, I used to love school. I was a bit of a nerd. I used to love maths. I used to love English. I used to yeah. love reading. I used to be really into that kind of stuff. Like that was, that was, I used to love it. I used to read comic books, X-Men, Spider-Man, Batman. Do you know what I mean? I was really into reading. I was really into school. I was really into geography. All the subjects, I was really good. I was a good student and I was, and I was probably in the top set. Right. Up at this stage of my life. And then, um, yeah, then my mum got nicked and went to prison and she ended up getting a 15 year sentence. So when she went to prison, Obviously, for the first two years when she went away, we were, we were just carrying on like normal. Yeah. Because my sister was so advanced and she, she knew how to get the benefit money because obviously we were on benefits. So she knew how to get that money each week. So she'd do the shopping. And it, it wasn't really any major difference. The only difference was that my mum wasn't coming back anymore. Sure. Do you know what I mean? And the first time we went to visit her, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even know where she was. I thought we were just, I was like, oh, mum, you're, you're here. How old are you at this point? I, f- I must have been about eight or nine. I think. Right. Yeah, eight or nine. And I remember the day she got nicked because... Did it happen at the house? No, no, no. So basically that morning, because my mum was a... So I went to a Catholic school called St Anne's Primary School in Kennington. And that morning, I'd always wanted to serve as an altar boy. Right. You know those boys that wear the black and white thing? Yeah. Like, I'd, 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 I used to be like, I want to do that because you'd see that it was like the best students could, would serve with Father White. And like to do that. So I used to think I'd love to do that. So this was the day. This was a Sunday. This was my day to serve. My mum was such an avid, like religious person. Do you know what I mean? I thought, yeah, she, she'll come and watch this because we used to go to church on a Sunday. Yeah. But she had to go to the airport that morning. And I was like, that's a bit strange. Like knowing my mum, like she'd normally be into this kind of thing. And she gave me six pound and pound coins. I remember it. And she was like, I'm going to go, but I'm going to come back. I'm going to try and make it back to watch you serve. So before, so before this day, whenever my mum went out, because I knew something wasn't right, I'd always say a little thing in my head. I'd be like, God, like, just make sure my mum comes home safe. Did you never ask your sisters uh, about what was going on? My little sister didn't really know because she was two years younger than me. My older sister, I remember my older sister saying things to me because her and my mum didn't really get on. They had a bad relationship. Right. So my older sister felt like she was basically a ser- <sighs> basically like kind of like a servant. That's how she felt. So they had a very, like, very, like, frosty relationship. Yeah. And I remember her, whenever she got angry, she'd kind of take it out on me, understandably. Do you know what I mean? And she'd be like, oh, mum, you know, your, your dad's this, your mum's just doing this, she's using me to look after you lot. I know she's up to something selling. She said she was selling drugs. Right. And obviously at, at that age, I was like, nah, not your mum. Not my yeah. mum wouldn't be doing that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. And then that's the stuff you see on telly. Yeah, that's not coming yeah, into exactly. my family life. Exactly. Yeah. And I actually tell her, I remember there was a time once, yeah, before she got nicked, where this guy called Jerry, who I looked at as an uncle, came round with this other guy. And they went in the living room with my mum and they were having this massive chat. And they started having a serious argument. And me, and my, me and my older sister, whenever people came round, we'd always try and listen. We'd get like a glass and put it on the wall, try and listen to what was being said. And I remember he was angry about something my mum had done. He was angry. And I just remember him saying, you take the piss, you fucked me up, blah, 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 blah. And I just remember thinking, fucking hell, what's going on there? Do you know what I mean? And they were in there for hours. And obviously as a child, like hours of like long. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, what's going on here? And then when he came out, he was with another guy. And as they were walking out, I looked at the other guy. And as he walked out, he put a gun in the back of his trousers. And I was like, fuck. Like, was that the first time you'd seen a gun? It's the first time I'd seen a gun, yeah. So I was like, what the fuck's that? So when they lived my mum was shaken up. And I was like, you're right. She was like, yeah, yeah, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. And then later on that night, there was someone knocking on the door. There was these two guys knocking on the door. And my mum was, my mum had this thing, because she, obviously now I know, because she was doing dodgy things. She'd always say, when I'm not in, never answer the door. Just don't answer it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And this night, my mum was in her bedroom and some, these, someone was knocking on the door constantly, constantly, constantly knocking. And I remember thinking, it's got to be something to do with that other, that earlier incident. But it didn't really, I just thought, you know, do you know what I mean? And then they left. Yeah. Yeah. God, what, what was your relationship like with your mum at that time? Because you said that your, your other sister didn't yeah. get on like with her. What was yours my mom, like? My mum, 
my mum's had her own, you know, hard life and stuff. And I always had a good relationship with her. I was a little bit spoiled. And my mum's, and, my, and, I, and I think I was my mum's favourite because I was the only boy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I think it was good. But she just wasn't around. Of course. Do you know what I mean? So it's like you could be the best parent in the world, but if you're not there with the kids, yeah. then it's not really the same. Do you know what I mean? You can buy, she used to buy me all the, like I'd have a Nintendo, a Game Boy, nice clothes, nice trainers, nice toys, all that stuff. But she just wasn't there. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. But, I, but the thing is, at that time, I wasn't even thinking in that way. It's only now I look back that mm. I can acknowledge that. But at the time, I was like, yeah, my mum's, I just couldn't wait for her to come back. Because whenever she came back, she brought gifts and we'd go out and we'd have a meal. We'd go to Deep Pan. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do remember We'd go to yeah, Deep yeah, Pan. Yeah, yeah. Have a pizza. I used to work in Pizza Hut. Is it? Wood Green when I was in <laughs> school. That was helping me out. And then I used to get all the free pizza and give it all to my mates. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, like... And yeah. what was the first time, like, when you went to go and visit her inside? So, I remember the first time. So, yeah, back to when I, you know when she got nicked. So yeah. So, she, she's, she's, she's gone off for the day. And I went to serve at church, came back. And on Sundays, they'd do Lost in Space. We'd always watch Lost in Space. Yeah. It was like a routine. We'd get rice in this bowl, same bowl, same spoon, watch Lost in Space. Then the Waltons. Do you remember the Waltons? Yeah, of course. We'd watch the Waltons. And then I remember thinking, I just didn't feel right. I can't explain it. I can't put it into words. But I just had a weird feeling. Like my instincts. I just had a feeling something's not right. So I said that thing. You know, I said whenever she went out, I'd say in my head, you know, God, if you're out there, just make sure my mum comes home safe. Yeah. But whenever I said it and before, I'd always feel a sense of like, okay, yeah, that's cool. But this time, it just wasn't happening. Do you know what I mean? I know it sounds a bit weird, but this no, is the truth. Yeah. It just wasn't happening. I was thinking, what's going on? Hours were going by, she wasn't back. I told my sister to phone her. She, she, her phone was ringing out. And then there was a knock at the door and there was two policemen in uniform. And they were like, you know, your mum's been arrested and we've got a warrant to search the premises. So I was like, what the f-? Like, huh? What's this about? Do you know what I mean? I was like, I was thinking, in my, in my mind, I was thinking they must have made a mistake. Sure. Do you know what I mean? So they started searching the house and I'll never forget this. I was standing in the kitchen just watching them searching it. And then one of them went, mate, do you want to do us a favour and put a kettle on? And me being the naive child I was, I went to start doing it. Then my older sister's coming like, what are you doing? Just, she went nuts. She just went berserk because she's thinking you're taking the piss. Do you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, of course. Anyway, long story short, then obviously we went to visit her and I remember thinking, What's this place here? This is a, like, I didn't know it was a, I didn't even know it was a prison because in my mind, prison was bars. But it was a building. You go in through doors and stuff like that. So I was like, what is this place? And there were people wearing uniform. Then we went into this room, and this metal table stuck to the floor. My mum was just sat there and all these women were just sat around. And I, was, I just found it like strange. All these women that kind of look a bit rough just sat in this room. My mum's in there with them. So I went in there, sat down, and then my mum just started crying. Do you know what I mean? And I was thinking, why is she crying so much? I was like, what's up? Because no one told me anything. Yeah. No one told me. She, only f the police said she'd been nicked. So I knew that to a certain extent. But I didn't know. I just didn't. Because I was too young to really comprehend it. Of course. And, but maybe a part of my mind was putting dots together. But I was just thinking, what's going on here? So we sat there and she was like, are you guys all right? Blah, 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 blah. And she just kept crying. And I remember just sitting there thinking, like, why does she keep crying? Like, what's going on? What? And I remember asking, like, what's happening? And she wouldn't tell me, innit? But then, funny enough, the table next to us, there was a woman with another woman, and they were kissing, yeah? And I was young. This, this, was, this, was, this was, like, in, like, the early 90s. Right. So I just found that a bit strange as a child watching sure. that. But then all of a sudden, these officers just swarmed on them and started dragging them apart. And I'm, as a child, I was watching that, thinking, leave them alone, like... Course. Why are you dragging them about, roughing them up like that? Yeah. But obviously now, I know they were probably exchanging drugs through their mouths. Yeah. You know what I mean? So anyway, yeah, went back. And then as time went by, it started to get a bit weird. Because I was like, I think, I don't know exactly how much time, but maybe a year had gone past. She still wasn't back. And we were still going to that strange place once a month. It was like... Was it only once a month that you were seeing Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going once a month. Right. I think my sister was going on other times because I had school and stuff like that. Of course. Yeah. So... And there was a, like my mum, so my mum would phone a lot and I'd speak to her. And there was, and she was like, when you go to school, if they ask you, you know, where anyone is, just say that, do you know what I mean? Your mum's just, do you know what I mean? Not around at the moment. Yeah. Whatever. Don't go into details and stuff like that. Of course. But then what happened was I got sick one day at school. I got ill. And they were like, where's your mum? And I was like, as being a child, I was like, I can't tell you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I can't say. And then they were like, what do you mean you can't say? So obviously once teachers start hearing stuff like that, they get like, Three of them just surrounded me, like, what do you mean you can't say? And I was like, I can't say. And they're like, no, Michael, like, 
it's all right, tell us. And I was like, she's not around. They're like, what do you mean? I just said, I don't know where she is. She's in this place where there's these weird women sitting sat around and she's just there. And they were like, what? They just didn't get it. And then obviously they got in touch with social services and then um, social services got involved. And then me and my little sister, like, they were t- like, we went into care for a little bit, but then my aunt came, got involved and then my aunt took us out. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then we were living with my aunt for a while. And then whilst living with my aunt, obviously now, now, how old was I now? Now I must have been about 11 because I missed the last year of primary school. Right. Like the last, sorry, not the last year, but the last six months of primary school, I stopped going to school because my aunt was moving me, moving us to another area, which was Croydon. So she was waiting for me to start year seven, fresh. Okay. So yeah, we moved in with my aunt and she had four kids of her own. And um, yeah, and then I started going to secondary school, St. Mary's. And how was, that, how was that? Living with my aunt? No, I started secondary school. Because all this... Yeah, like... All this, ha- th- all this must have had some sort of effect on yeah, you. Yeah, 100%. Like, because my mum was... That's one thing about my mum. She, even though she wasn't around, when it came to parents' evenings and stuff like that, she was bang on me about school stuff. She was like, you know what I mean? I like, need to study. She was bang on that. I think a lot of Nigerian parents are. So when I started secondary school, because I'd always been one of the top people, sl- like... The last moment I remember in primary school, everything just started to decline. So I used to be a good singer. I used yeah. to sing in the choir, I used to do solos. And then I remember we did, we did the, um, the nativity play. And I had to sing this song, the angel Gabriel from heaven came. I just couldn't sing it. I don't know what it was. Like my, I just lost that ability. Like I, I think my voice broke eventually, but I just didn't have that thing that I had. That, 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 I don't know what it was, like a... And he sort of drive, drive or, or like passion or, or that spark. Yeah, that spark was gone, and I remember being conscious of it. And people used to always be like, "Michael, you're right. Like, what's happened? Are you right?" And I'd be like, "Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'd be in the playground. I didn't want to play football anymore. Everything was just down." And then I started secondary school, and obviously it was because you know, like when you start school, your mum, you know, what I mean, your mum takes you in. She buys you the stuff you need, yeah. a new bag, the best bag, the trainers, the gear. Like that was gone. My mum, because we, my mum was selling drugs, we were getting good stuff. Yeah. But now there was nothing. And I'm living with my aunt, who had different principles. She had four kids of her own that she was taking care of. So me and my little sister were a bit like just on the side. Because I think she had her own motives for why she was taking care of us. Do you right. mean? I don't want to get into that. But anyway, we started year seven. And it was, it was a different area. It wasn't my area. It wasn't where I was from. No friends. Go, whereas everyone there, they'd grown up around there. So they knew, oh, you're from that primary school. You're from that primary school. Yeah. I was like this outsider. Yeah. Me and my little sister started. And like, it was just a different vibe and a different culture to where we had grown up in, in Lambeth, Brixton, Kennington, that area. And now it was Croydon. It was a bit different. So we started this school, St. Mary's. And like, quite quickly, I just turned into a, I just turned into a bit of a horrible person. Well, not a horrible person. I was, what, 11, 12, but I just, got, I just started getting angry a lot. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Parents even... I think it's pretty understandable. Yeah. Actually. I mean, there's a little kid having to deal with that. Yeah. It's, got, it's got to come out at some point. Yeah. If it's going to come out of aggression and anger. Yeah, so literally. It, yeah. So I started secondary school and, like, I just started, I just started disliking the pe- to other people around me because I used to think, oh, you've got everything. You've got your mum, you've got your dad. I'd hear people like, oh yeah, on the weekend we did this, on the weekend we did that. On parents' evenings, people's parents were turning up, on my parents' evening, no one was turning up. Of course. And the teachers obviously knew there was something a bit dodgy. Do you know what I mean? So I just turned, I just turned into a bully. Do you know what I mean? I did just, you make any friends or? Yeah, I had a, I started hanging out with the bad, the bad block. Whereas before I wasn't really like that. Now I was more finding more in common with them because, you know, his mum was a bit, do you know what I mean, an alcoholic or this and that. You need and to find other people yeah, with that resentment. With that and resentment. I can, I can join yeah. that gang. There'll be, exactly. be acceptance there. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, and then I started doing that. And then I just started going. Then school just didn't matter to me anymore. Because I started thinking more about, I, start, I, was, I was very depressed as a child at this stage. Because I had n- no parents. I didn't know where my mum was exactly. I knew, now I knew she was in prison, tell her I. But I didn't know when she was coming out. I didn't know how long the sentence was. Yeah. And, and years were, like, months and years were going by. And I was thinking, fuck it. Like, no one told me what was going on. No one cares what I think. So I said, like, I'm just going to do my own thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I started. And obviously, I didn't really, I just felt, I felt like where I was staying, I wasn't as loved as maybe I should have been. Because obviously, no one can look after you more than your own mum or your own dad or whatever it is. Do you know what I mean? And I remember, I remember there was this day we went to, we had a sports day, yeah? And obviously, because I wasn't, because I wasn't, 
because I wasn't really, I didn't get any pocket money or like that. So I steal a lot, yeah? So we had a sports day and when everyone else was out playing football, I crept into the change rooms and stole this guy's wallet out of his pocket. And obviously the teachers found out and they were like, who's got the wallet? And I had it in my pocket and I was thinking, fuck, they're going to find it on me. Then they found it, took me to the headmaster's office. And this headmaster, Mr. Devout, he was a proper cunt. I mean, like, he was like, you're going to end up in prison. You're going to do this, you're going to do that, blah, 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 blah. Actually, sorry, tell a lie. What happened was, that's how he normally was to me. Yeah? Right. But this day, he was acting different. I was thinking, why is he acting a bit different? And what happened is my dad had turned up. My dad turned up to the school. Right, out of the blue. Out of the blue, because wow. he used to turn up every now and again. <clears throat> so he turned up. So he obviously was away, and your dad's turned up. So when I got back to my aunt's, my dad was there in it. And obviously he, he said to me, you know, your mum's in prison. And he said, do you know what's going on? I was like, no. He said, your mum's in prison. And I was like, how long she coming out? He said, she's been given 15 years. 15 year sentence. Which would have meant, which would have meant you do two thirds of that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I was like, I was like, fuck. Because I think it had been about, what, three years now? So I was oh, thinking. That's, like, that's another blow to a little another kid. Another blow. Yeah. Off. So I was thinking, Fuck. She's not coming out for a minute. So I was like, you know what? I made a decision. Because I, I, I don't know, I kind of toughened up a bit. I was like, right, you know what? I need to just forget about that. And just do my own thing from that one. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, next day I went into school. And obviously, because my dad had gone now, it's back to normal. Mr. Devour was like, you know what I mean? Like, you stole that guy's wallet. You're wrong and blah, 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 blah. And obviously through school, like, do you know what I mean? It was just, it was just nightmare after nightmare. Do you know what I mean? I was getting in trouble, getting suspended constantly, yeah. fighting with people. I mean, I used to bring knives in. I, I was a mess. Do you know what I mean, I had people bringing me like money. I used to say to, I had about seven people bringing me two pound each day, like out of their pocket money. I was like, right, I need two pounds tomorrow from you. I need two pounds tomorrow from you. So for me, that's fourteen pound a day. Do you know what I mean that, that's so how I'm? That's extortion, crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> extortion. My God, in. that's how I. That's how I got my pocket money. Do you know what I mean? But the thing is, I remember there was a teacher called Mr. Osgood and he was like, Michael, like, you're a very intelligent young man. Like, he used to always be trying to whisper in my ear, like, Michael, you're clever. I loved English. I still liked English. Yeah. I still loved English literature. I still loved that class. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that, I remember my English teacher was like, Michael, you're just, you're such an anomaly because you walk around with this bravado, but I know you're not really like that. Mrs. Mrs. Ahern. She's like, you walk around with this bravado and I know there's stuff going on at home, but you're actually quite... Uh, intelligent person. And I, I just, you know, when people say that to you at that age, you think, oh, shut up. I mean, you don't know what I'm doing. I'm, yeah. I, all I cared about was just trying to get money and all that kind of thing. But looking back on it, you think of those yeah. kids in those positions now, when, you know, we're adults and you go, well, of course they're, exactly. they're hiding something or they've got this huge resentment and they are smart and they, they don't need those teachers to go, you're going to make nothing in your life. You're going to end up inside. Yeah. You need those teachers to go, come on and yeah, crazy exactly. out of you. Exactly. But did, she, did she get through to you at all? No, nah, she no no her and Mr. Osgood, funny enough they ended up getting married. Her and Mr. Osgood <laughs> <laughs> her and Mr. Osgood didn't they didn't get through to me because I was more I was more in tune with the guys I was hanging around with. And because I was hanging around with a certain certain group of guys, because I'd grown up in Lambeth and in, in that in that in London at that time, Brixton was like it was not how it is now. I mean, Brixton was a place where it was jumping off, and because I knew the odd people from around there, from because of where I was before, yeah, I used to go there to connect back with those lot. Of course. So I was hanging around with them, and yeah, like it just started going from bad to worse. But then what happened was my older sister, so she was living at my aunt's, yeah, and she wasn't getting on my aunt at all. Like the whole right. household turned against her, and even my aunt kind of turned me and my little sister against her a little bit. Right. So she was like, she left. And then she said to me when she left, she went, what? She went, don't worry. When I get older and I get a flat, I'm going to come back for you, you and you and me. But I have to leave. I can't live here. Do you know what I mean? So she, she fucked off. And I was like, yeah, she's left us. She doesn't give a fuck about us. Anyway, long story short, when I was 16, she came back. Did so she? now she would have been 20, 22, yeah. She came back and she was like, I've got a flat in Lewisham. I want you and Eva to come and live with me. And obviously, because I was 16, I could go. Yeah, I was at that age where I could leave. So I left and went to live with her. Then my little sister came to live with us. My aunt was throwing a wobbly because of, for other reasons, which I'm how, not going to. How did you feel about that when she came back? I was like, great. It was, because it was like, because for me, that was one thing. It was a struggle living in that house because that wasn't really my family unit. And it's weird when you're living in someone else's family and they have their way of doing things. Of course. And you're an outsider. 
plus you can't even express how you feel about things because they're all a family. Yeah. So if I was like, your mum's taking a piss, like, oh, don't talk about my mum like that. Do you know what I mean? So I couldn't even express what I was feeling. No. So I was, so I was this repressed, angry. So I'd be at home repressed and in this weird box place. And I couldn't say what I thought. And then sometimes they could be a bit mean on the odd occasion and be like, oh, you know, your mum was a drug dealer. Oh, that, that, that. That's why you're living with us. You should be grateful. There was that kind of going on in the house. So I was like, ah, that's why I didn't like staying there. I used to run away a lot as well. I used to right. run away all the time. And then... Um, Were you going back to sort of the, the Brixton area? Yeah, to I was going back with, down there or yeah. friends that I'd made in that area. Do you know what I mean? I used to run away. So when my sister came back, she, she came back, took me and my little sister reverse. So I, was tri- so I was going from Lewisham to Croydon to school or whatever it was. And then what happened was she got this job at Comet, another place that sells fridges. Yeah. And then she got me a job there. So I was working there for a bit. When you were 16? When I was 16. So the, the GCSEs, were they a write-off? Yeah, GCSEs were a write-off. Yeah, okay. GCSEs were a write-off. I tell her, like, before that, because, because of the lack of, like, help from my aunt, like, I mean, she had her own kids, I started working in a bakery when I was in year nine, in the morning. So I'd get up at four o'clock, no, no, five o'clock, go to this break, bakery for three hours to eight, then from there, straight to school. Do you Jesus. Know what I mean? Because, because I, I weren't getting any money from anywhere else. Do you know what I mean? Of course, but how can, how can anybody sort of get their head down and do any sort yeah. of, get anything in their brain exactly. when they're up at that time? Kids. Then, I, then I started smoking cannabis heavily from about 12. Before this, I was smoking cannabis every day. Right. Weed, constantly. Even at school, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah at school. That was our thing, like lunchtime, go into the flats, smoke roll spliffs, smoke them, blah, 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 blah. Me and a couple of friends. And then, like, obviously, in school, that's what people, re- that's what people like, that people like the bad boys in school. It's like, oh, yeah, they're the bad boys. But I was one of them. Do you know what I mean? My name yeah. was, like, oh, Michael Balligan. You know what I mean? Have you heard of him? Do you know what I mean? It was a bit of, I was a bit of that kind of guy. So I liked that at the same time. And I think that's where I was getting my sense of self-worth from, from that kind of thing. Anyway, long story short, started working at Comet, left there. Then I started getting into selling drugs. So I'd been selling weed when I was at school, like just, I mean, little bits just of little, here and yeah. there, yeah. Then I started selling, one of my mates was working for this other guy selling heroin and crack in Kentish Town. Right. And he was like... Which was not your area Which is not my all. area, this is North London. Yeah. And people, like, we had street names in it. His name was Tiny, my name was Future, yeah. He's like, oh, Future, like, I've got a line, like, this phone's dinging, like, it's ringing off. Come down here, like, we can make money. I was like, right, it's like a dream. That was like my ambition. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I used to justify it in my mind. That's about my mum sold drugs. So, do you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. it's just destiny, isn't it? And when it's, you were a kid, she was bringing in all the good yeah, trainers, the good exactly. trackies, all the good stuff for you. So, and I, and I started becoming a really materialistic, money orientated person. So, you know, I was going down, I was going to Kentish Town, selling heroin and crack with this phone that used to just ring. And these heroin addicts and crack addicts would come and meet us. Can I have four white, four brown, da 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 da, constantly ringing throughout the day, bang, 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 bang. And, and I was making all right money. So I, he was used, I was basically the muscle because I was a bit stocky for my age. He was a bit smaller, his name was Tiny, he was proper small. I was basically the muscle. So, I, yeah. so if he's going to do any deals, I'd go with him, do you know what I mean? Bend, like screw my face up a bit. And then that was going all right. But then what happened was we went to get some, so basically the people that gave us the phone, we basically sh- shrugged them off. I mean, we just basically took the phone and started doing our own thing with it. And um, I, so I went you were to, going what straight to is, you were cutting out that middleman and going straight to the source to get no, no, no. What we were doing or... that so basically they'd give that phone was so that phone. So how it works is that phone when you when you're selling those kind of drugs, you want to build your phone up, right? So that means just get it to ring as much as possible. So you're giving out like, your number, you're giving out like, your number, and it starts to ring. So that phone, and obviously the more work you put into it, the more it will ring. So if you're on time with people, giving them what they like, the good stuff, it rings more. So when, he, when, when, when this guy had got us to do it, we were so on it, we got it ringing. And we were like, hold on a minute. When we first got it, it wasn't ringing that much. Now it's ringing nonstop. Yeah. Why should he get these benefits? So we just ran off with the phone. Right, He's okay. phoning us like, where are you? I need my phone. And we were like, what do you mean? I just thought, fuck him. Do you know what I'm saying? Gone, yeah. And obviously we were a bit wild. So he was a bit thinking, you know what? Maybe it's just worth just cutting ties with that. Do you know what I'm saying? So, but, so basically I went to go and pick up some stuff. And I ended up getting stopped on the way back by police. But it was all in one, so I got done for possession. Yeah? Right. So that, so... How much were you caught with? I was caught with a half ounce of crack cocaine, all in one wrap. Right. But I lied until I was using it, and then it just got a possession charge, and I had to do a fine, I had to do some re- um, community service, whatever, yeah. Then that fell through, and then I, that, we, that phone just went dead because we started taking a piss. 
And then another area came up. And one of my other mates had another phone in Portsmouth. Yeah. So I started going down to Portsmouth with, with him doing the same thing. But obviously, long story short, I ended up getting nicked in Portsmouth with 87 wraps of heroin and I think 30-something wraps of crack cocaine. 87? Wraps, just little tiny wraps. Right, okay. Because I mean, that phone was, because it was Portsmouth, like, and they couldn't get drugs. So we were coming from London. It was like, oh, London gear is obviously a bit better and all that kind of stuff. So we were in Portsmouth doing that. And then um, I got nicked in Portsmouth, ended up going straight to Redden Prison from there. So now I, now I was... 18, 17, 18. So I went to prison in Port in Reading. I got a three year sentence. Three years. A three year sentence, yeah. And I had a girlfriend at the time that I'd met a comic called Kelly. <clears throat> and she'd found out I was cheating on her when I went to prison because my my phone was in her name and she'd found out I'd seen this girl called Crystal. And then she broke up with me. And obviously when you're in prison, do you know what I mean I was fucking like like my first day in prison, I remember it. I was, I, like, obviously you get brought onto the wing. And I remember looking, thinking, fuck, like, it was kind of a rite of passage, innit? Yeah, I'm but, sure. Yeah, and I was like, fuck, I'm in prison, like, fuck. And I'm looking around, and there's all these doors, and there's all this noise, and people are just moving around. And I was like, fuck, this is deep. Do you know what I mean? Did you feel you'd gotten over your head at this point, or did you feel... Funny enough, like... Because you'd grown, you'd grown up too quick mm. from what I can hear yeah 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 100% and now you're what's 18 mm. and you're right you really are playing with the big boys now because yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah, inside yeah, yeah. did you were you scared I was yeah so basically my mum had been released I forgot to tell you that my oh, mum really? had been released when I was 16 she came out so she ended up doing 8 years 6 months she got released and then when she came out it, it, like the way she got released was so unorthodox, like it was like a miracle because she should have been deported. But do you mean the, do you mean the stars aligned or whatever? And she got yeah. released, and she was struggling because she was living with my older sister. And I remember, the, like, pretty soon after she got out, she propositioned my older sister's boyfriend to get to move some stuff. And my older sister was like, "No, you're taking the piss. You've just been away for all this time. What are you doing? What are you thinking? Yeah. Blah 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 blah." Anyway, I don't want to go into that, but. Yeah, so I started selling drugs. My mum knew what I was doing. She's like, don't do it, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, go to prison. First day in there, Portsmouth. I mean, Reading Red Prison. Him. Because that was their local nick for what young offenders. So I was in there, had my bags. And, I was, and this officer was like, wait here outside the door. I just started crying. And this fucking guy, like, God bless him. I'll never forget him. Like, I started crying. And he walked past. He was sweeping the landing. And he looked at me. And he's like, mate, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, myself. And he went, mate, look, I'm going to be honest with you. He went, don't ever cry on the wing because just imagine that everyone on this wing are lions. And when you cry outside your cell, you become food, innit? Yeah. So he was like, don't do that. If you want to cry, do it in your cell, close the door, blah, 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 blah. Do you know what I mean? I, I remember like, I was like, I just brushed up quick because I was like, fucking hell. Do you know what I mean? I, I didn't, do you know what I mean? And I could fight. I was, I, it's, not some, it's not like I was completely out of my depth. I was quite brave. But obviously, this is new territory. Yeah. We're in prison now. Do you know what I mean? But when well, it's like that thing, and it's like what they say, right? Oh, right. Well, at school, he's the cock of the school, so you yeah. don't mess with him. Then you maybe go to a different school. Oh, there's somebody. There's always yeah, somebody harder. Exactly. And now you're with yeah. And and I'm, and I'm in Reading, and all the guys in this prison are from Southampton. They're from Portsmouth. They're from um, rugby. They're from. They're like different. It's like a different vibe of criminals. Different energy. Do you know what I mean? But what I didn't know at the time was that because I was from London, there was a certain respect. Because I was in London and what I was in jail for and all this stuff. And the stories I tell telling people, like, they'd heard about things that I'd been around. Like, the 28s were a gang in Brixton that I used yeah. to know quite well. And they'd all heard stories about these guys. So, after about two weeks, I was basically one of the... Do you know what I mean? I was basically one of the lads on the wing. Do you know what I mean? So, you, felt, you feel accepted? Yeah, then? yeah, 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 yeah. And then I started to... And then, obviously, like, you always assume that in prison, like, it's all this roughness. But it's not... Like, you, 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 you... you you get really close with people, man, because everyone's, everyone's away from their family, so you kind of become this family. Do you know what I mean? And then, um, yeah, like, I went through my sentence, and then I got a touch. I got, I got chosen to do this thing with um, this gas thing, like changing the gas pipes under the ground. I did this course. Inside I, you did the inside course? Inside I did the course, yeah. and then I went to a decap prison where you can go out, so I started going out to work and coming back. Is this after the three years or during the three this years? This is during the three years. Right, okay. But I fucked it up because I'd done something stupid. I can't remember what I did, but I fucked it up. And then, they, and then I, I stopped going. They sent me back to a normal prison. And then I got released, 
came out, they started selling drugs again. After, after, you did the full stretch? I did, no, no, I did a year and a half because you do half. Right, you so see, did a year and a half, half came out. Went straight selling, back into went it. Went straight back into it, started selling weed. Do you know what I mean? And I was doing all right. I was selling weed and I was making good money and I was around these guys or whatever. And then I started selling coke. That's when I started to get into coke as well. And I was just doing that. So you were, you were using at this point as well? Yeah, I was smoking yeah. a lot of weed. I never, I'd never, I've never done any other drug other than weed in my right. life. Yeah. So I was smoking weed, all this stuff's going on. And then, um, and then I got arrested for something and I spent a year in prison on remand for this incident that happened. I don't want to go into it. Okay. But it had nothing to do with me. But the only reason why I got arrested for it was because someone that did, that was involved in it, phoned my phone that day. So on the police records, they just arrested everyone who was that guy phoned that day and just arrested us all when I was on remand in jail for a year. Right. Came out and I was like, you know what? I need to change my life now. This is fucked up. So I needed a job. So I looked through the newspaper. This is like a week after me being released, looking through the newspaper, bang, I saw this application for NatWest Bank. Yeah? yeah. So I was like, fuck it. I'm good with maths. I'm going to apply for it. So I phoned this telephone interview. Woman asked me a couple of math questions. She's like, if you had £10 and you bought this and that, and that, how much change do you have? I was just reading the answers off. And she's like, right, come in for a proper interview. So I came in for an interview. Obviously, because my schooling had declined, I wasn't as sharp anymore. I missed the whole computer thing. So what, that was in this, at this stage in secondary school, my, when I was in secondary school, yeah. from year nine to year 11, that's when computers were really getting into the education system. And I, didn't give, and I just missed that whole bit. Sure. So I wasn't a sharp. Obviously, I could do basic stuff, but I just wasn't up to date with it. So when I had my interview with this woman, lovely woman, man, she was so nice to me. I said to her, look, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not, I might not be that sharp with like, you know, the, the computer stuff, but I can sell. I can sell anything. So she's like, yeah, I like that. I like, I like the way you sound. She was, I said, I can sell anything to anyone. <laughs> so she was like, we're going to put you on, so I'm going to test you. So we're going to put you on the tills as a cashier. And what I want you to do is to get as many leads as possible. Get as many what? Leads. Sorry. Leads. So you know when you go into a bank to cash some money in and, they, and they, they're getting a deal, they're like, oh, you know, you can get a loan or, you know, you can, okay. that was, that's a lead. Right. You, I mean, you probably don't know this, but I've worked in a bank, so I know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I go into the bank, so, I, so she put me somewhere, I want to see how many leads you can get each week. So I was just thinking, yeah, I'm just going to, so I just started, so when people came in, I'd be like, mate, you know, you can get, you know, you can, what car, I, I used to use my, I used to be creative with it. I'd be like, mate, what car do you drive? Oh, I've got a Polo. What's your dream car? A BMW. I'd be like, you know what? 25 grand loan sitting there for you. What are you doing? <laughs> 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 and, and like, obviously some people didn't, but people were starting to do things. Like I was getting people to upgrade accounts. I was just banging out and I became yeah. the star of the branch. Because I was a bit different, a little bit, a bit of a geezer. And you were probably speaking to people like there were people instead yeah. of like numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. I had yeah. my own little thing and people were like, I don't know how you do it, Michael. I don't know how you do it. But anyway, my manager was like, you're wasted as a cashier. We need to get you as a customer advisor where you're in a room actually doing the thing. And that's where everything went wrong. Because I couldn't, I wasn't articulate with the computer stuff. Plus I started doing a few dodgy bits here and there. Do you know what I mean? Start, do you know what I mean? Doing little dodgy bits. Do you know what I mean? I'm not going to lie. You don't have to go into it. So yeah, don't, yeah, don't yeah, worry, yeah, 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 yeah. Do you know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. But um, obviously I'm a different person now. But, um, <laughs> we'll get on to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So basically what happened was the big thing that I fucked up with, this woman came in and I, she gave me her bond certificate. And now this thing she gave me, you can't get another copy. If you lose that, you're fucked, innit? Yeah. I genuinely lost it. I lost the bond certificate. And there was another girl in this branch doing dodgy dealings. So basically, like, they start investigating the branch. And when I applied for the job, there's a part of the job where they say, what were you doing within the last five years? Of course, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I lied, didn't it? I didn't say I'd been to prison. No. I said, oh, you know, I was doing whatever, whatever, blah, blah. I was at college, I made up all these lies. So they hadn't got around to checking it. But because this branch was dodgy, they started checking stuff. So they found out I'd been to prison. So... I got a phone call and they were like, Michael, can you come in? And just, we just have a chat with you. So I've come in normally and there's a man sitting there from the home office and, and then she went, Michael, can you tell me what you were doing between 2001 and 2003? I was just looking at her and I was thinking, fuck, yeah, they know I've been to prison. And I was like, look, I'm going to be honest with you. Yes, I've been to prison. The reason why I didn't say is because I knew if I did say, you wouldn't give me the job. She went, Michael, like, that's all really well and said and done, but, like, you know, you've basically, that's basically fraud. And so we're going to give you two options. 
you can just leave now and walk out and we'll just knock it on the head or you can stay on and we'll just take it to court. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to leave in it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I left and I just thought, you know what? I just got drunk. I was like, you know what? That's not for me. I'm going to do what I need. I do best, which is selling drugs. So I started selling drugs and I was robbing as well. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to say, <laughs> I said, oh, no, do you know what? I made another decision. I'm going to knock all that on the head, knock all the dodgy stuff and I'm going to... Yeah, oh, yeah so no, no, went no, no, back no. Went to it. Went back to it again. <sighs> went back to it again. But now, what I was doing was now I was not only selling drugs, I was robbing other drug dealers for big amounts of drugs now. Right, just, so that's... I just went on a mad one. That's really dangerous. I mean, yeah, I just went on a mad one. Because I'd always been robbing. I used to rob secure record boxes... I still go into shops. We used to go into banks back in the days when they had the panels. You could jump over to the other side, clear the drawers. I just went, I just started, I just went berserk. Anyway, long story short, I ended up getting in a shooting in a nightclub. Right. So I've gone out of a few mates in Brixton. An incident jumped off. My mate got battered. He had a gun and then we got disarmed. And then guys, this guy was, this guy was shooting at me because I was, I went up to the fire exit to try and go down to help him. I couldn't because the guys he got in a fight with were part of the club. Like the guy who owned the club, that was one of his relatives. Yeah. I'm not going to say any names, but a massive thing jumped off. So I had a gun on me and I started shooting. They're shooting at me. It's all going berserk. Anyway, my mate, a couple of my mates got nicked. I managed to get away in it. Long story short, I was under observation for six months. So this was in 2000 and 2006. Yeah. So I was under observation for six months. And then one day I was at my mum's house, sat there. I was just, I was, I had, I'd done a few dealings in a day. And then boom, the door just came off. Bang. Police with machine guns. So I, all I could hear was, shut up, get down the floor, get down the floor, get down the floor. So like the living room door was ajar. So you know, like the crack, you know, like where the, you know, where the things like. Yeah, where the, the hinges are. Yeah, where the hinges yeah. are. I looked through there and I just saw my mum with like four red dots on her forehead. And I just thought, Fuck. She just she just fainted. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I just I just came out and stood in front of her and I was like, well, and they're like, get on the floor, get on the floor. And then obviously they took me to the police station, went to the police station, and they were like, and then I was, and then the, that, the policeman that nicked me, he was a bit he was kind of, his operation tried him, so they deal with black on black gun crime. Yeah? Yeah. So he was like, yeah, like, because other things had happened. I'm not gonna go into them too much, but other things had happened and they knew me in it. They knew who I was. And so also they were, if they'd been trading you for six months. Yeah, they knew, big, they knew everything. Buck. They knew everything yeah. I was doing. Do you know what I mean? And they're like, mate, look. So I was like, so I just said to him, I was like, mate, what do you think, like, the chance of me, like, do you know what I mean, getting off this? I just said it to him, like, we're all in the car. Just quickly said it to him. And he went, you're fucked. Do you know what I mean? So he got to the police station. My solicitor turned up and they had a video. And they went, they gave him the video and we watched on CCTV. It's basically me shooting down a fire exit. Do you know what I mean? But me being the person I am, I was like, fuck that, I'm not getting guilty, yeah? So my mate had been nicked. So I ended up going to Brixton Prison. So now I'm, I'm going to Manage Jail now. Yeah. yeah. Gone to Brixton Prison, my mate's in there. Was that a different game altogether than Young different Offenders? Different game, don't get me wrong. Is Young Offenders was more fights. But this was, now you're in with murderers. Yeah. Fucking terrorists. Fucking all kinds of people. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, Just wrong ones. Wrong ones, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So... So I've gone in there, like, real, real villains now. Do you know what I mean? So and I'm what a, age are you now at this point? I'm 20, 23. Oh, 23 wow. now, yeah? So I'm in jail, and I'm, I'm, I, I, we, I got in a cell with my mate, who'd also been next, so we were co-defendants on this case, innit? So I got the paperwork. I'm, I'm one of them people. Once I get an idea, I just jump in it. Do you know what I mean? I just go into it. So I said, let me see the paperwork. So he gave me the paperwork, made a coffee, sat down and just started analysing every single thing of that paperwork. And I found something and it was that day, the, the club. So basically, their CCTV, ev- am I going too deep? No, 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 this is so good. The, their CCTV evidence said camera one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. No, camera one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 11, 12, 13. And then at the bottom, the guy who dealt deals with their CCTV said, I was asked to omit camera 10. So I didn't know what omit meant. So I got the dictionary out. I said, like, omit. It said, leave out. So I was like, that's a bit dodgy. Why was he asked to elite? I thought I'd found the golden ticket. I was like, where are we going home? I woke my mate up. I was like, wake up, look at this. He was like, huh? Because he was a bit, I mean, he wasn't the smartest tool in the box, but he didn't see the weight of what I'd found, did he? Yeah. 
So anyway, next time I saw him, my solicitor came to visit me. I was like, look at this. They were like, that is fucking great. We're going to investigate that, blah, 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 blah. But, so long story short, we went to court. We went on trial. And that, that evidence I found only helped my mate. Right. Do you know what I mean? Did it's nothing it, for you. It did nothing for me because there's me outside fucking pulling something. Because you couldn't see what it was, yeah? I pull something out of my waistband like that, yeah? And it's kind of blurry. Then I go over to the fire exit and then you see me go in there. Then everyone starts running. So obviously in real time, I've gone over to the fire exit, started shooting down. Everyone's running because they're thinking fucking out gunshots. And then I run off, put something back in my waist and run off. But me being the madman that I am, when I saw the CCTV... I was watching it. And as I pulled something out of my waist, my sunglasses dropped. So I had to, I got into my own head like, oh, fuck, that could have been a sunglasses case. Do you right. know what I mean? I, just, I know it sounds dumb at now, no, no, but, no. but I was like, it could be a sunglasses case. My sister was like, yeah. I was like, no. I was like, do it. She was like, look, Michael, blah, 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 blah. I was like, trust me, just fucking do it. I'm telling you, I can get off. Because I was looking at big time on this one, man. Anyway, long story short, my mate gets found not guilty. I get found guilty. And they were trying to give me an IPP sentence, which is basically, it's an, it's, they've, they've abolished it because it's against people's human rights. So what right. it means is, if you say you're for instance, you get five years IPP, you do the whole five, but you cannot leave that prison until they think you're no longer a risk to, to the public. So you can end up doing 15 years. Right, okay. in, all, in, all, in order to convince them you're no longer a risk, you need to do certain courses, but, but not every prison does those courses. So you might have to go down to Scotland to do that course. Then you've got to apply to go to another jail in fucking Bristol to do that course. And before you know it, you've just done about 10, another, you've done another five years. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So they're trying to give me that. But, and my barrister was like, fucking hell, we need, you can't. So I knew of people that were doing that sentence and they'd been in, I knew my mate had been doing two years IPP and he'd been in jail for seven years. And you don't know when you're going home. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's a head fuck. So anyway, luckily for me, I didn't get that sentence. But the judge... So when I was going out for sentencing, this is, this is one of the things that is marked in this story, yeah? The judge goes, Michael, you know, I should give you 15 years for this, but I'm not going to do that because I think I've watched you during this trial and I know you're not the person you portrayed yourself to be in this, in this courtroom, but, and I think there's a talent there. I think you're creative, you're creative. And I think you need to figure out what your thing is, yeah? So I'm going to give you nine years. And I, at the time, I didn't give a fuck about anything. I didn't even hear what he said, to be yeah. honest. But somewhere in my mind, it was in there, it got stored up, yeah? And I was fucking stressed out. I mean, I'm going to have to do four and a half years straight. So in my mind, I was thinking, I'm not going home next year. This is 2000... And s- so I got sentenced in 2008. So I thought, I'm not going home 2009. I'm not going home 2010. I'm not going home 2011. I'm going home 2012. That's a mind fuck. Yeah. I'm going to be here for all that time. Do you know what I mean? So the first two and a half years of my sentence, I was a fucking nightmare. Do you know what I mean? I hated everyone. I was in fights with officers, in fights with other prisoners. I was Still loads of rage, rage, loads of anger, loads of resentment. Bringing, I was bringing drugs in the prison. I was doing all kinds of things. Do you know what I mean? I was putting all kinds of strings. So then they were like, right, you need therapy. You need therapy. This guy's obviously got some issues going on. He yeah. needs therapy. So they sent me to HMP Blunderston, where they've got a therapeutic community, like a wing, which is just for fair therapy in it. Yeah. So I get on this wing, there's 40 prisoners, and the rules are a bit more lax. Like, you don't, your doors don't get locked, and like you have meetings every morning, and then you have a big meeting on Friday of the whole wing. So every morning you go into small groups, so the wing's split up into four, so there's 10 people in each group. So every morning you have small groups. Then on a Friday you have a big group with the whole community. And it was called The Community. And it was about challenging each other's behaviour. So the first day I got on the wing, I was like, what the fuck is this? I mean, I was like, what the... Guys walking around planting flowers and fucking... You feel it was like a holiday camp compared to the other ones. Yeah, I was like, I didn't like it. I was like, this ain't real prison. This ain't... We're the fucking bad... We're the the villains and that. Do you know what I mean? That's what I was thinking with my mentality at the time. Yeah. And the first day I got there, there was a guy there that I knew from another prison. I mean, him started talking. We we ended up arguing. I was like, you know what? This guy's a... F-. So I followed him out to a cell and I just clumped him in his face. This Scottish guy came up to me. He's like, listen, you want to be careful and doing that kind of shit on this wing because it's not going to go down well. He said, be careful. I was like, cool. Next day, they called, someone called a meeting because it, it, news travels quick in prison. So someone heard there was been a fight. Obviously, these are people who want to change their lives. Everyone, apart from me, probably. And some people are playing a bit of a game, but most of the people on this wing generally want to change their lives. Yeah. So they called a meeting. It's like, right, we heard there's a fight. So they want to mention anything. I was thinking, no one's going to say nothing. It's prison. It's just, you don't snitch in it. 
that guy who came to me and said, do you want to be careful? Put his hand up. And the guy was like, what do you want to say? He went, I'm just going to say it now. I saw Michael attack, da 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 in his cell. I was thinking, what? You came up to me and told me to, to be careful. Anyway, long story short, I went through the therapy, did that for two years. Then when I got to the end of the therapy... You were, were accepting of the therapy, obviously not at first. Not when, at first. When I was did playing you... a bit of a game, if I'm honest, because I just wanted to go to a decap prison where I could go out and come back. Right. Do you know what I mean? I wanted to get my leg over. I wanted to fucking, do you know I mean? See my friends, see yeah. my family, all kinds of things. Eat some proper food, go out. So I just kept my head down, but I was kind of playing a bit of a game. Do you know what I mean? I started reading. I used to read a lot of books. I used to read like strategic books, you know, like, like um, Machiavelli. Do you know what I mean? The 48 Laws of Power, all these books. I just, I want to be this mastermind. I don't know what's wrong with me. You know what I mean? So anyway, so I finished the therapy and then I went to a decap prison. And when I was at this decap prison, and I was around these other guys who were kind of a bit more sensible, I started to think to myself, I think I'm, how old was I now? About 25 or 26, yeah? I started thinking, what do I want to do in my life? Do you know what I mean? Like, what am I good at? And I thought to myself, I thought, I want to open a restaurant one day. I don't fuck, I want to be a chef. Right, okay. Yeah? So I started doing an MVQ, MVQ at this prison. And this officer who kind of liked me was like, Michael, you know there's a prison that has a restaurant inside of it called The Clink. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I have heard of it, yeah, yeah. yeah. And like, so basically, not anyone can just go and eat there. You've got to be like, you know, barristers, judges, that kind of thing. They yeah. go there and they eat and it's all a bit of, and rich people, it's like, oh, prison is serving us really nice food. It's all a bit <laughs> of a thing, like a bit of a, do you know what I mean? So I was working, so, so they sent me to the clink. So I went to the clink and there's this guy there. And when I got there, there was a guy, they were, they were making a documentary about it. And Idris Elba was doing the voiceover. So he wasn't there, but they were like, oh, Idris Elba's doing the voiceover, blah, 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 blah. So this guy interviewed me, long story short, I got the job, started working there, finished the course. And they were like, Michael, we found you a job. So, you, so basically I'd go out from prison to this job, come back to the prison every night. What was the job? So it was at RADA on the bar. No, no, it was like rather in their kitchen, in their refectory. Right. Yeah. So you'd used what you'd learnt now and they'd got you a job. They, they'd found me a job. I, I didn't know what RADA was. They were like, we've got you a job at this place called RADA. Do you know what it is? I was like, no, what is it? They said, it's a drama school. I was like, what's a drama? I was like, drama school? What's that? They're like, oh, it's a place where actors train. I was like, oh. I'm going to be honest, in my mind, I think there's probably some attractive women floating about. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I was thinking. I've been in prison. For- uh, look, people who go to drama schools, lads usually think there's yeah, lots of pretty actresses exactly. floating around. Yeah. That's what I was thinking in my, in my mind at the time. Yeah. So I went into RADA. First day, they took me there for an interview. I was with a prison officer, sat in the bar. And then, have you been to RADA before? Yeah. You see the bar, they've got all those pictures of people on the wall, of the students there. I was talking to this woman, I was just looking around the bar. I was thinking, look to the wall. I don't know why I asked this question. It just came out. I was like, has anyone that's ever worked for you, anyone ever got in on, this, on, on the course? I, I, didn't, I, had no, I didn't even know. I didn't have any ambition about acting. Where did that life. come from? I don't from? know. I was just curious. Yeah. And she went, yeah, there was a girl who was on the foundation called Fran who got an MBA, but that's a bit different because she was already a student. She was just doing part-time hours in a bar. I was like, okay, cool. So I was working in the kitchen, yeah? So I'm working in the kitchen. First day at work, the chef goes, can you cut the veg? So I was like, yeah. So I started cutting the veg up. But he was like, no, 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 can you do it? Like, you know when you see chefs go... Yeah. He said, no, don't you know how to do that? I was like, no, I don't. He's like, well, I need the veg done by a certain time. And if you do it the way you're doing it, we're going to be forever. So sorry, but no thanks. You can't work in the kitchen. Oh. So I was like, fuck. For me, it was heartbreaking because I was thinking this is a good way to start off being a chef. Yeah, And course. that's what I thought I wanted to do. And I was kind of taking it kind of seriously. Because obviously I was getting older. I was thinking I need to find something. Do you know what I mean? So they're like, unfortunately, Michael, because you're not fast enough in the kitchen, we're going to put you onto the bar. Okay. So at the time, I was devastated. I was like, fuck, man, do you know what I mean? That's a bit of a liberty. Like, I've come here to be in the kitchen. They've put me on the bar serving coffees and, st- and shit, do you know what I mean? So I was on the bar working there. But at least you still got a job at No, no, point, exactly. So, yeah. I was getting paid some all decent money. Yeah. I was saving it while I was in prison. Right. So that's why I was like, great. And, but now, I was actually meeting people now. Because in the kitchen, you're closed off. You're away from everyone. But now I was I'm in and amongst it. The teachers yeah. would come over, can I get a coffee? <clears throat> and everyone was quite curious about me because I was so different to anyone there. Obviously, Rada's quite a middle-class place. Yeah. And there's me like, blah, blah, blah. like what's going on, mate? Do you know what I mean? Like, do you know what I mean? They're like, who's this guy? So I started working there. And then... Um, <clears throat> My manager was like, Michael, when it's quiet, you can go in and watch the shows. Right. I was like, oh, what kind of shows are they? They're like, oh, Shakespeare. And I remember, because I'd always been into English, I knew a little bit about Shakespeare, a little bit about things like that. So I was like, oh, yeah, I'll go and watch a show. So I went in to watch this show, and it was, have you heard of a play called Mercury Fur by Philip Ridley? 
No, I haven't. It's a, it's a play about, it's a, it's, a, it's a crazy play. It's about, you know, these fucking, these guys. It's a long story to go into it, but it's a play. I could relate to it. Right, it's, okay. There's an element of drug dealing in it. There's an element of siblings, you know, some fucked up childhoods and all that shit going on. So I went in, I sat down and like, the way it was set up, it was very immersive. Like you were basically in it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I sat there. I was like, what the fuck is this? It was all dark and there's a torch. This guy was coming with a torch and it was all scatty. And I was like, what the fuck is this? And had you, had you been in a theatre and seen a play until this no, month? No, I'll tell you, I went on a school trip. We went and saw Starlight Express. Right, okay. When I was in primary school. That's the only play I'd ever seen in my life. I'd never done any acting in my life. And this yeah. is a long way away from Starlight Express. A long way away from Starlight Express. Yeah. And I was like, I saw this play, man, and it was fucking dark. And I came out of it and I started crying. I was like, fuck, man. I couldn't, I just felt, I just felt uncomfortable. Do you know what I mean? Like, I went back to the jail and obviously I went back to jail at night and I was like, because I was working at RADA, some of the guys knew what RADA was and they're like, bro, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you got in there, man. You don't know what you got in there. So I'd come back at night and they'd all want to hear what stories about the day and what, oh, because some of them haven't been out yet. Yeah. But they'd all want to hear the stories like, what did you do? And I'd always tell stories and I'd be quite animated. And one of my mates, Marvin, went, he went, do you know what? I think you could be a good actor, you know? Who said this? One of, a friend of mine called Marvin. Right. He's a future. I reckon he could be a really good actor, you know? And I was like, nah, that's not for me. Acting, nah. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, and then there was a guy at RADA called Harry Jardine, yeah? And he'd been writing this play called Quandary. And he came up to me one day. He went, Michael, you know what? I've been writing this play. Would you mind reading him for this character? He's a drug dealer. And I was like, nah, I don't know about all that, mate. Do you know what I mean? That's not for me. He went, no, nah, just give it a go. Please just do it. How you Just be yourself. Just read it. Do you know what I mean? Do the play. So I've done a little reading with him. And he's like, Michael, yeah. he said, in all honesty, yeah, I'm going to tell you right now, you can act. I think you should try acting. And again, I was like, nah, that's not for me. Do you know what I mean? Rada, all, all that kind of, I was, I was not on that. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, long story short, I tried to bring a phone back in with me into the prison. Yeah. Right? Right. And I got caught with that phone. And they were like, right, you know what? You're not going to Rada again. They stopped me from going there. Sent me back to a normal prison. Because I was so stressed out. Because remember, all these touches I'd had in my life, yeah. I kept fucking up. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? Fuck. And I, st- I started smoking this thing called Spice. Because right, it's okay. like cannabis, but it's fucked. Yeah. And it doesn't come up in your, it doesn't show up in your piss tests. So I could smoke it in jail. So I went with a load of Spice back to a normal jail. And I started suffering from mental health issues, psychosis. Yeah, and I was in a bad way because the, the guy that they moved me in with a guy who just lost his dad, so he was fucking mourning his dad. There's me stressed out. I've just been thrown out again, and I've got spice and I'm giving it to him. We're smoking it, and he's crying, and I'm stressed out. And, and he snored like a bear. Oh god! So I couldn't sleep. So I couldn't sleep. So I was going nuts. I was going a bit loopy. Do you know what I mean? I'm not going to lie to you. I was going a bit loopy. Anyway. Just off, so one night I was in my cell. I asked to get into a single cell. I went in a single cell and I was like, you know what? Everything just got on top of me. I was like, you know what? I'm going to sit here tonight and I'm going to think. If I don't figure out what I'm going to do with my life tonight, I'm ending it. I'm going to kill myself. I made a decision. That is it. I made a noose, had it on the side. I turned off the TV, turned off the radio. I turned off the light. I was sat in my cell in darkness by myself just thinking. It's like, what am I meant to do? Like, I was like, it's not fair, my mum, this and that, blah, 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 all the stuff I went through. Well, it's not fair, bruv, like, do you know what I mean? Life isn't fair. And I started thinking to myself, what could I do with my life? What could I do? What could I do? What could I do? What could I do? And I just sat there in silence and I was sitting there for hours. It must have, I started this at about seven o'clock and I was sat in about 11, 12, just sat there thinking. I kind of went through my life from, from my earliest memories all the way through. Yeah. And then, like, at different moments, I remember other people had said to me, you're, you can act when I was younger. Like that teacher, Miss Mills, was like, Michael, you know, you're quite creative. Other people had said to me, you know, you could do this, you could do that. Even at the bank, they even kind of the saw bank, it. Yeah, yeah, even at the bank, the yeah. judge yeah. that came up, I was like, fuck, I remember that. Then it came to me, it's, I can't explain it, man. Like, I don't, I'm not, I don't believe in God in the conventional sense. I believe there's something in it. I don't know what that thing is, but something just shot into my mind, like, whew, it was acting. That's what I'm meant to do. And like, I'm telling you now, yeah, no word of a lie. I've never seen anything like it in my life. The moment that thought came in my head, I just, everything just dropped off. All the stress. I can't explain it, man. Like, 
everything, the stress, the strife, everything I'd been through, just dropped. It just dropped. I was like, fuck, I found it. I found what I meant to do. I know what I meant to do with my life. I know it now. Yeah? Yeah. So the next day, this psychiatrist, this drug worker, and the thing is, like, they say in it, like, people say, like, when you find that thing, and you're in tune with that thing, whatever it is you're meant to do, it's as if, like, the fucking Red Sea part. Yeah. So the next day, this woman came to my show. She's like, Michael, you know, officers have been complaining and saying that, you know, your mental health isn't the best and, you know, we need to talk about that because we might need to section you. Right. I was like, no, 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 no. I'm fine now. She's like, she said, why do you think you're fine? I was like, I know what I'm meant to do. I want to be an actor. She's like, right, Michael, look, we need to seriously talk to you about this now. She's, <laughs> she's thinking, I've gone nuts now. Do you know what I mean? I was like, no, I'm telling you, I'm being genuinely serious. I'm not smoking anymore. I know what I want to do. I want to be an actor. She went, I don't know what it was, but it's just the way I said it to her. She believed me in it. Because you like, believed it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So she went, you know what? I just happen to be a part-time drama teacher. No way. I swear, I swear to God, the next day after I had that thought, the next day, Craig, do you know what I mean? So she was like, I'm going to bring you in place and stuff to read and literature and stuff and blah, blah, blah. So she'd bring me in place. King Lear, the first play I ever read was King Lear. Yeah. I didn't know what the fuck was going on. <laughs> but I, but I kind of, eventually I kept reading. I kind of got a sense of it. I kind of got to, yeah. got understanding of it. Read that. Um, the importance of being earnest, all these plays. Do you know what I mean, I just read them and read them because I was so hungry. Cause to, 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 I was like, this is it. So I, I think I, I gave up when I started reading King Lear. I, didn't, is it? I couldn't make it in the tale of it. <laughs> oh man, that is un- unbelievable. Nuts. So then, so then, and then like, I, I started watching TV religiously. Like, I watched, it was Grand Christmas, you know, when they started showing like specials for Christmas. Yeah. So that year it was Great Expectations with Ray Winston in it and a couple of other actors. I was watching it. And, and I'd always loved film. I'd always loved films. I'd loved films religiously. Do you know what I mean? Not just gangster films, but like all kinds of films. I sure. just loved. And I remember if I saw a good bit of acting, I'd rewind it and be like, "Oh, that was that was sick." Do you know what I mean? I just, just I don't. It's just I just used to do that. Yeah. And I, but I didn't really connect it. Anyway, my girlfriend at the time, I was like, "Look, I need you to go online and print off what you need to do to get into drama schools." And there was a girl at RADA who I wrote a letter to and I said to her, kiss her. And she said to me as well, she, me and I were messing about when she asked me to help her learn some lines and I was doing it. She's like, and she said to me, she's like, Michael, you can act. Fucking hell. Do you know what I mean? So she said that to me. So I wrote a letter to RADA to her and a teacher at RADA called Joan. I said, look, you know, because they were wondering, where's Michael gone? So I was like, look, guys, you know, I got recalled back, but I've realised that I don't want to be a chef. I want to be an actor. And then, and then Joan didn't respond to me, but Kizza was like, Kizza, she was like, Michael, you know, people that work at RADA kind of always think things like that. You know, it's a very place you can come and easily start thinking that they're there. But there's another drama school called Identity that works with a lot of people of multicultural backgrounds, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, don't try and frog me off. With, I mean, I'm going to RADA, bro. I'm, I'm <laughs> fucking about with that. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, this is it's, it's a fucking story and a half. So anyway, I, for some reason, so I've got all this... So I've got all this literature about drama schools, Lambda, Rada, Bristol, da, 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 all these different drama schools. You're still in prison I'm still in prison. Point. Yeah, right. I'm in jail studying these things. I get really obsessed with this stuff. I'm studying, okay, Bristol, you need two monologues. That one, you need a song. That one, you need this. I'm studying. I've got charts on my cell. Do you know what I mean? Pictures and all this. I'm going berserk, yeah? <laughs> anyway, I get released, yeah? And I'm, I'm trying to get in contact with the woman who gave me the job at the bar. So I get in contact with her. She's like, you've got no space. I mean, if I can get back on the bar, then I've kind of got a way in, yeah? Yeah. And for some reason, it went over my head about a student loan. For some reason, I just didn't even comprehend that. I was thinking, I'm going to need to pay 28 grand for this. So I started selling drugs again. No, my God. Yeah, seriously. I started selling drugs again. But this time, it was just to go to drama school. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So... After about six months, long story short, I saved 23 grand, yeah? After how long, sorry? After six months of me being released, I saved right. 23 grand. I wasn't buying anything. I was out in the rain, walking around, giving my number out. I was just thinking, drama school, drama school, acting, acting, acting. While I was doing this, I was doing workshops at a place called Crisis, Shakespeare workshops with this guy called, um, fuck, Peter, Peter Searles. Yeah, he's an actor. And he went to Lambda and he was teaching us Shakespeare. I was with a bunch of homeless people there's a couple of people with mental health issues and this weird bunch of Motley crew just doing these Shakespeare workshops. Do you know what I mean? So I was thinking I need to do anything I can to get into it and they were yeah. free as well. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, long story short... That's amazing that they were free. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Do you know what I mean? Long story short, 
I ended up getting nicked, selling drugs. Went back to prison again, yeah? Michael. Yeah? Um, Went back to jail again, yeah? Listen to this. Yeah. Gone back to jail again. And obviously I was on license because I'd been, I'd done five, I'd done four and a half years and I was out for six months. Gone back again. Back into prison again now. So, bruv, I am, fu- I'm thinking after all of that, what did I do wrong? Because I was selling drugs to get into r- dr- drama school, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, got this book called The Alchemist. Have you ever read it? I have read it, yeah. yeah. Got this book, The Alchemist. Someone gave it to me. I was like, fucking hell, I started reading it. So I read this book. I read it four times back to back. Do you know what I mean? And I realised that if I was gonna if I was gonna go to drama school and become an actor, I needed to just just, just do that. That was it. I was have to cut off people, have to cut off ties, yeah. forget about drugs, forget about that, and I just have to focus on that. So I was at rock bottom now. And you're not saying that when you're at rock bottom, the only way is up. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna have to just power through this. So I was like, right, you know what? That life to me is dead now. Crime is dead to me now. I don't want nothing to do with it. I was like, this is me now. It's like, cool. When I made that decision, again, things started going my way. After six months, I got released. When I got released, I was like, I need to get that job back at the bar. The woman phoned me three days later, said, after I, I was sitting in my room, I was thinking, I need that job back at the bar. That'll be such a touch because I'd be able to make money and I'd be able to do little workshops, whatever, whatever. Three days later, I get a phone call. Hi, Michael, it's um, Jules Heckman from Harbour & Jones. Um, we just want to know, do you want your job back at the bar? I was like, yes, please. So I start working at the bar. When I get there, there's a guy called Will Alexander who was in his third year when I was working on the bar when I was still in prison. And I said to him, Will, I need, to, I need some help for my monologues, mate. He said, I don't know what I'm doing. He said, I've got this guy called Andy Johnson. He's a drama teacher at a school called Hurtwood. I think it's like one of the boshest schools in the country. Right. He, he, get in contact with him. So I phoned him up, turned up to this pub. He looks like a guru. He's got some massive big scarf on. He sat at a pub. He's like, you know, looked at me up and down a bit. He, went, he gave me this paper and it had a couple of words in it, like just some philosophy and all this kind of stuff. And I, he's like, take that away. I'll read it that and then phone me. So I went away, read it, phoned him, met him up. He was like, have you got any speeches? And while I was at work on the bar, this guy called um, Ryan Hayes, who's coming to see the play on Friday, he was like, I reckon you'd be, I reckon you could do it. Because of your life, I reckon you could do a sick Henry V, St. Crispin's Day. <sighs> He's like, I think you should give that a whirl. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I was like, I started doing it. And I was trying to do all this. I mean, he's like, mate, well, forget that. Just just do it like you're talking to your mates. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I did that. He's like, Michael, there it is. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, I've gone to meet this Andy guy. And I forgot what Ryan said to me. Like, he went reading. So I read this. I've done the speech. But I don't know. Because I was in front of this guy who was a bit of a drama teacher. I started doing what, I don't know, my inter- some fake interpretation. And he was like, he went. You didn't feel as comfortable yeah, with him as you did. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, he's like, you can read, which is a start. Do you know what I mean? And because cause he knew about my story, this man worked with me two to three times a week for six months, every week, without charge. And he was charging people like 80 pounds a pop. He didn't charge me a penny because he just took a liking to me. Do you know what I mean? That's incredible, yeah. man. You say, that's, you're so lucky to have that. Yeah. And then I started working with this theatre company called Synergy Theatre. So I did a Meisner course with them. Right. I didn't know what all this stuff was. I did a Meisner course with them. Then we did a scene study where people came and watched. And the woman who owns the company watched it. She said, Michael, you've got, a, you've got a very interesting stage presence. I want to cast you in a play that I'm doing. So I'm going to get you to audition for it. Audition for it. Got down to the last two of this guy called Ricky Theron. Yeah. Didn't get the part. But she's like, she like, I can't give it to you because you're just not ready. But I want you to stage manage it. And I'll pay you £400 a week. Just to say, my display, but I think it'll be good for you because you'll be in the room and you'll be able to learn. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I did that, learned, I was watching them like a, I'm a hawk. When I, like I said, when I'm on something, I'm like, Pfft. so I was just watching everything. Michael, I can tell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was watching everything, watching them prep, watching them do the stuff, warm ups, all this stuff they were doing. I was like, okay, action in. And I was like, what's all that? Do you know what I mean? I was watching all this stuff. So anyway, that was in me. That was in some in there somewhere. Anyway, it's audition time now. Yeah. First audition was at Royal Welsh. So I go there. I had two Shakespeare's, Julius Caesar, Cassius from Julius Caesar, when he's trying to convince Brutus that we yeah. need to get rid of this man. And I had Henry V. But I just thought Cassius was more interesting. Yeah. So I went in there, did my speeches, did Cassius, did this other one. Got an email the next day. Sorry, mate, it's not going to happen. So I started thinking, hold, I started thinking, hold on a minute. Have I gone mad? What made me think I could act? What, what, what am I doing? Yeah. 
So I went to see Andy. I was like, mate, I was like, you know what? Fuck this. I went and bought a bag of weed. I was like, I was smoking it with it. And I was like, no, fuck this, not for me. He said, Michael, don't give up. Because Andy's philosophy is all good, nothing bad. Right. He said, he said, that's a learning experience for you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And the start of the rejection. In the start of the rejection, yeah. do you know what I mean? So he goes, all right, you know what? Ride Rada in two weeks. So he said, let's get ready for Rada. So I went to Rada. This woman who knew me from the bar, she's like, Michael, you know what? To be fair, to be fair, it's not fair if you go with someone who knows you. Do you know what I mean? So we're going to have to put you with people you don't know. So when I went to the audition, that, that girl, Kizza, who I'd written the letter to in prison, who was my mate when I was working in the bar, she was the runner. So she came out, saw me, she's like, oh my God, you're doing it. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's like, I was like, when we, I, was like I don't want you in the room. She's going to make me nervous. She's like, don't worry, I won't look at you. Obviously, she, she was sat there like that and she fucking started staring at me when I was doing my monologue, oh. which wasn't a minor. So I did my contemporary, which was from a play called Pure Gold by Michael Bim, about this guy who's a bus driver, but he's thinking of going into crime to support his family. Yeah. Then I did Cassius. I did the Cassius speech. And she was like, mm. she went, have you got another Shakespeare? I was like, fuck. I was like, yeah, I've got Henry V. She's like, yeah, give me that Henry V. So I stood there and I just went back to Ryan Hayes. Yeah, just do it as yourself. Just do it as yourself. Just do it as yourself. So I just did that. And she was like, come over, sit down. She went, now nah, that's what I'm talking about. Right. There you go. Do you know what I mean? So I did that. Um, long story short, I got into Drama Centre, RADA and Rose Bruford. Do you know what I mean? Right. Bang, got into all three of them. And I was going to go Drama Centre, if I'm honest, because I just liked the vibe there. It seemed a bit more edgy, a bit more gruff, a bit more gritty. Yeah. But then I was like, you know what? I can't not go to Rada, do you know what I mean? Yeah. The way, the way I've got past these rounds as well, if I went into that, alignments and stuff and things, instincts just kicking in at the right moment, because I'd never done any acting. Yeah. So I was just operating off pure instinct. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So got oh, into... And passion. You've and got passion. such great passion. Yeah, 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 100%. So I got into these schools and obviously I was like, yeah, it's going to have to be Rada. So yeah, that's, that's how I got into acting. Do you know what I mean? Michael. <laughs> <laughs> It's so lovely to meet you, and I'm really, I, I'm don't, I don't know you, but I'm really proud of, oh, of thank you. you. I'm man. really chuffed for you, man. It. Genuinely, I and I'm so it, thrilled that you graduated and you're on this lovely tour of people, places, and things, and you're still feeding yourself. You're mm. still getting the passion. You're still learning, and this is the start, man. This is just the start of it for you. No, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate that big time. Thanks so much for coming on, man. Yeah, yeah, no problem. <laughs> And breathe. What did I tell you? A big one. What a story. When uh, myself and producer Griff went to Manchester, I knew there was going to be some sort of story. I was not prepared for that. And I don't think you were either. Um, yeah? Good un? I think so. Now, it's episode 18. Next week, I can't tell you who it is because I don't know. I haven't made my mind up yet. I'm looking at producer Griff. Do we know? Oh, he's, he's, he, uh, he's not sure either, but trust me, we've got a lot in the bank and everyone is an absolute belter. We're really, really proud of who comes on and we're chuffed that they come on and they'll be so honest and open and tell their stories. And the messages that we've had from you is that the podcasts, are, you're enjoying them. Even if you're not an actor, you're enjoying them. But some actors have been in touch with me saying, that, you know, I'm finding it hard at the moment. I'm having a bit of a lull. And the podcasts are really helping. They're really inspiring. So, look, that's, you know, I'm thrilled, honestly. I'm really, really touched. I'm really chuffed. We both are. Producer Griff is giving a big thumbs up. Now, if you want to chuck us a few quid, you know we've got this Patreon site, yeah? Go to patreon.com forward slash two shot pod. Check out all the stuff there. I'm not going to ram it down your throat, all right? But if you want to, just think right here. If everybody that downloaded gave us a quid for every time they downloaded, we could carry on making podcasts for quite some time. Think about it. Okay? Brilliant. Want to get in touch with us? It's twoshotpod at gmail.com. The emails we get are lovely. I'm still going through some at the moment, so apologies if I haven't got back to you yet. We are on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You know that. It's at twoshotpod. And anything else to tell you? <gasps> the lineup for... Our Christmas special is complete. 
everybody's locked in place. I am just finalising a date. We have a venue, a lovely, exciting venue, and six very, very special guests. Trust me, you're not going to want to miss that. What else you're not going to want to miss? Episode 18 next week. I shall see you then. I've been Craig Parkinson. He's been producer Griff. This has been the Two Shot Podcast, and we're really chuffed you joined us. Until then, you take care. The Two Shot Podcast is presented by me, Craig Parkinson, recorded and produced by Thomas Griffin for Splicing Block. Our music, our brilliant music, is courtesy of Then Thickens. Cheers.